We are talking a lot about sci-fi in the next uh, half an hour. In uh, January, I uh, published a magazine together with the Mozilla Foundation where I brought together artists, researchers, designers to discuss new visions of the future. So I was working in tech back then and I was frustrated that especially in tech when we talk about the future, the narratives are often bleak and dystopian. And what I mean with that, I'm going to show it in a second. So with the magazine, I set out to explore different stories of the future, projects that help us think beyond the current and to imagine more diverse and inclusive and preferable futures. But before I'm going to talk about the narratives and stories, I want to kick us off by giving you an overview of some sci-fi narratives, both uh, dystopian and utopian, and how they have influenced the development of technology. So let's start more than 100 years ago in 1902, when... Um, Georges Méliès uh, released one of the first sci-fi movies of all time, based on a novel um, by Jules Verne. In a trip to the moon, three travelers undergo misadventures and adventures. Uh, they travel in this uh, bullet-shaped projectile to the moon and back. Um, and back in the day, space travel was a big utopia. The book was published in 1870, so about 100 years before the first moon landing took place. And nowadays, many people even doubt that we've ever been to the moon or that Earth is a sphere, so, which is something that we've known since the ancient Greek. This is an article from last year, 2018, where Mad Mike, his words, not mine, wanted to confirm with his own eyes that Earth is flat and launched a homemade rocket. Talking about space, in War of the Worlds, this is an adaption from 1953, the Mars invasion was stopped in its tracks when the advancing forces succumbed to what basically amounts to the common cold. Today we are the ones invading foreign territory and we are scared about bringing those earthly bacteria to Mars. The Guardian um, warns in this next... Um, in this next article, don't let bacteria-laden humans contaminate Mars in a headline. Then to a book that a lot of you have probably read. In 1949, George Orwell published his famous book, 1984, a truly dystopian novel full of surveillance and normalization. But instead of taking it as a cautionary tale, we've copied it straight into our terms of service. Here's a tweet from Parker Higgins in 2015 where he compared um, the book with the, smart, uh, with the Samsung Smart TV privacy policy. Um, and since you can't read it, I want to quickly read it out. out. So on the left, um, he has taken an excerpt from the book talking about the telescreen, which says, any sound that Winston made above the level of a whisper would be picked up by it. Moreover, so long as he remained within the field of vision, which the metal plague commanded, he could be seen as well as heard. There was, of course, no way of knowing where you're being watched at any given moment. And then the smart uh, privacy TV policy reads as following. Oh, sorry. Switching back to the right. Hmm. Reads as following. Please be aware that if your spoken words include personal or other sensitive information, that information will be among the data captured and transmitted to a third party through your use of voice recognition. So this is no surprise to us in 2019 because we've read about um, Google, Google's OK Google and Alexa, but in 2015 this was something new that these companies are transmitting the data to other uh, third parties. Let's move on. In 1968-2001, a space odyssey popularized many sci-fi staples. And according to Samsung, this movie predicted the iPad. You can see it here, uh, described as a fool's cap-sized newspad, so an A4 newspad. Astronauts used tablets, computers to conduct spaceship diagnostic checks or to communicate with Earth. So Floyd, the main character in this movie, sometimes dreamed and said, wow, is this really the, ma the last uh, word in man's quest for perfect communications? I'm speeding away from Earth and I can read any um, news headline of the, of the um, newspapers I please. But 2001 is better known for its supposedly subservient machines taking over. 
As a reminder, this is HAL 9000. It's the software and the central nervous system of Discovery One. That's the spaceship that's traveling to Jupiter. And HAL performs duties such as checking the crew during hibernation, checking the vessels, playing chess with the crew members. But when members talk bad about HAL behind his back, the computer lip reads the exchange, so the machine lip reads the exchange and processes to wreak revenge. So with HAL 9000, um, Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick basically kind of predicted the rise of our obsession with artificial intelligence. So it's to no surprise that in 2016 we have the headline, AI has beaten humans at lip reading. And you don't have to search long until you see examples where AI has gone wrong in real life. This is a screenshot from Microsoft's chatbot Tay that they released a couple of years ago who wandered radically off message and began sprouting Nazi statements online. I'm sure some of you remember it. And today, androids may not dream of electronic sheep, but real sheep are dreaming of nightmare robots. Um, this is a picture from Japan, from a newspaper there, where farmers have put out these robot figures in order to keep away predators from their sheep farms. And while sheep dream of robotic werewolves, some tech companies have been watching too much Robocop. This is a picture from Robocop and have wet dreams about AI and policing. Just to quickly um, remember the plot, it's set in Detroit in 2028. A massive corporation has purchased the city's police headquarters, and one of the officers, Murphy, dies during duty. And because he signed over his body to the police department, they revive him and basically reanimate his body and make half cop, half uh, robot out of him um, with weapons, facial recognition, predictive analytics, and the ability to transmit live video. And a company formerly called Taser, today known as Exxon, apparently loves this movie so much that they, that they are taking a lot from this movie into their corporate story. So they are saying, Every cop will be Robocop. You can see the body cameras. They are, they are well known for the tasers, the yellow pistols here, but now their main market is body cameras that you can see up here. And they've started a program where they're giving out these body cameras for free with data storage, training and support. This is what their office looks like, very futuristic and uh, a sci-fi touch. Um, and the second favorite movie of this organization is a movie called Minority Report. The movie where Tom Cruise predicts crime, predictive policing basically, um, where artificial intelligence meets policing. And that's also what um, Exxon wants to do. Um, they imagine combining law enforcement data with live footage from the body cameras. And not only since this report by ProPublica, Machine Bias, we know that this might be a bad idea, because in this report, and I highly recommend reading it, ProPublica proves that a software which is used in courts in the US is biased against black people. Remember hoverboards? Well, actually, never mind. Um, and today, or not today, in 2011, um, Black Mirror got pop popular. It's basically also despair and misery brought to you by technology. We have fighter rob robots who want to kill you. And we have social scoring as seen on Twitter and in China. So this was a quick ride through 100 years of uh, popular science fiction with some examples. Um, I want to stop this right here and take some time to reflect on what we've just seen. Um, research in human-computer interaction, for example, shows us that a lot of researchers acknowledge the influence of these sci-fi stories and that the sci-fi stories have played a big part in triggering their interest in science and inspiring breakthroughs. So it's to no surprise that a lot of these fictional technologies have later emerged in the real world. And what I'm wondering is that if science fiction turns out to be some kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, how can we use that to our advantage? What we see in a lot of stories is that the future turns out to be a compromise between what we can imagine and the things that will actually happen. 
And unfortunately, as we have seen, a lot of these sci-fi blueprints are rather dystopian. This is an article from the New Yorker where they write a golden age for dystopian science fiction. Uh, science fiction um, works share a pessimistic outlook. They basically signal the same basic message. Technology is more likely to ruin our lives than to improve them. The New Yorker also says radical pessimism is a trend and the stories basically tell you despair more instead of being a fiction of resistance, science fiction has become a um, fiction of submission. But of course I don't want to paint it all black, of course there's popular science fiction which uh, stands for bright futures, for prosperity and peace. Just look at Star Trek, um, where for the time we have a very diverse crew, in times of the Cold War a Russian is steering the ship and mankind has united uh, and is reaching for the stars. Or another example is uh, Other Stories by Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, this is a book from the Mars trilogy, Green Mars, where he keeps alive the idea that humanity can create a better future for uh, themselves. Uh, in his stories, Mars is not an alien planet, but a planet to be terraformed into a new world. Um, he talks about new um, landscapes, but also the habits of ordinary people in extraordinary landscapes. And Kim Stanley Robinson says that anyone can write dystopia. Today, you just have to combine some news headlines, but it's really hard to write utopias. And the works of Sting, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson remind me of uh, this movement. It's a um, net movement called Solar Punk, a movement that combines technology and uh, the future, a movement that imagines um, prosperity, peace and sustainability and beauty in cities. You can see the skies are green, uh, the skies are blue, the cities are green and it's basically a counter movement to steampunk and uh, cyberpunk, two directions that are very black and dystopian um, where fossil fuel plays a big role and um, that solar punk basically counters. Um, and these are the futures we're fighting for. And this is also uh, part of my work, this request for optimism um, to a call to action to artists, to writers, to technologists, to all of you to create new visions. And I've been publishing a magazine. I brought some copies there here in the front in, in case you want to take one home. And in this magazine, I collected a series of stories about the future. And the first story and narrative or the first person I want to introduce you is Adrienne Marie Brown. Adrian is an American author, she's a women rights activist, a black feminist based in Detroit, Michigan. And in her work, she points out the importance of science fiction for community organizing. Audrey says, all organizing is science fiction, bending the future together into something that we have never experienced. A world where everyone experiences abundance, access, pleasure, peace, dignity, Adrian's work is influenced by black sci-fi writers such as Octavia Butler and Samuel Delaney. She uses the term visionary fiction and she says visionary fiction basically gives us the opportunity to explore the futures that we long for, to test them, to test them in stories. And in her visions, and that's why I took her example after the mainstream sci-fi, in her um, visionary fiction, marginalized people, bottom-up, collective change are at the center of the stories. She says she's not looking for dystopia or utopia, but the space in the middle, because she says we know that dystopia and utopia basically coexist. A couple of years ago, she added a book called Octavia's Brood that features sci-fi stories from the social justice movement in the US where writers talk about a world without prisons, a world without borders, something that is really hard to imagine for us, but when we write it down and we, when we collectively work on these futures, they might come become reality. And that's also what she says. She says, we have to be able to imagine these futures in order to act on them, in order to gather people around us that fight for these futures with us. Um, so the stories have a clear goal, goal. They challenge norms and help to create more inclusive, fair and sustainable futures. But from visionary fiction to visionary technology, this is an image from a place called Dynamic Land in Oakland, California. It's a place where researchers, technologists, designers are working on the computer of the future. They call it a dynamic medium for all the people. 
And stepping into this space that was there three years ago really feels like stepping into the future because they have abolished all interfaces. So you don't find a single computer in their computer, in their space. And they say that a computer of the future is a space that you walk into. So how does this work? Um, most of the technology is installed in the ceiling and is projecting down from the ceiling. And you're interacting with everyday objects, with paper, pencils, um, with things that you find. I'm going to show you an example in a second. And this idea of computing comes from um, computing pioneers such as Alan Kay or uh, Doug Engelbart, who said that the computer is not only a machine that helps us to process information and to increase efficiency, but to augment our abilities as people. So they developed the computer without interfaces where you don't have to learn the language of the interface, but you can immediately start. And let me show what this looks like in um, reality. So here they are playing around with sheets of paper. You can see the projections. They are looking at a timeline. Um, and the cameras detect the code by the spots. So every piece of software that is um, exercised um, is basically printed on these sheets of paper. So there's no black box. You can immediately see what code is being processed by the machine. It's a bit hard to see here on the screen, but I can encourage you. I want to encourage you to check out their website. They have a kitchen in their space and um, invite communities from Oakland to join them. And um, as well as Adrian, Marie's Brown, uh, Adrian Marie Brown's work, their work is also focused on communities and the needs of communities. So anyone can walk into this space and start experimenting with the technology. Um, Dynamic Land is a community space and a possible future, and it's definitely a counter a counter vision to the science fiction that we've just seen. Um, I don't know whether it's inspired by science fiction, though. It's its own piece of visionary fiction. Um, and when I was reading up on Alan Kay, I found this famous quote of him, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And there's another article in the magazine that reminded me a lot of the quote, because in order to be able to um, invent the future, you have to, um, you need certain power structures, you need people that listen to you. And there's an article in the magazine about an artist called Augusta Savage. Um, she's an African American artist, a sculptor, and she was born in 1892. And since she never really had the resources to sculpt her wor works in bronze, bronze is something that would survive for hundreds of years and be part of our future and influence our future, she had to sculpt her works in clay. Clay, a very fragile material that is not as long lasting. She, painted, she even painted her artworks in the color of bronze to suggest um, that it's bronze. But by showing you this article, I want to point out that there's mechanisms, power mechanisms of whose works and whose ideas persist in the future. So her works didn't really persist because of financial instability, systemic racism, and gendered inequality. Um, another example from the magazine is when I imagined the Universal Declaration of Human Rights with a group of human rights lawyers and activists. So we were thinking, okay, we're stuck in this here and now, we are fighting against laws that are upcoming, that are surveilling us, but what if we sat together and imagined um, what's upcoming, what's in five or ten years, what are the digital rights we need and we want. And here's a quick um, example of some rights that we came up with. For example, the right to disconnect, the right to live in a Faraday cage every once in a while, so the right to um, just be without internet, like, like being on holiday, but also being on a disconnected holiday, and the right to non-digital access to government services, for example, or the right to not be judged by a machine. And I think this is really important work because otherwise you're stuck in what's here and now and you're not thinking ahead. You're always just countering what others are presenting to you. And to come to an end, I found it great that uh, Taiwan and Taipei were mentioned in the presentation before because that's also my final example for the future of democracy. Um, I want to introduce to you Audrey Tang. She's a hacker. She's an animal rights 
activist and a truly inspiring person. Since 2016, she's the digital minister in Taiwan without portfolio, so she's not the member of a party. She's a transgender woman who describes herself as a conservative anarchist. And Audrey really believes and stands for citizen participation, radical transparency, and intersectionality. So she's been working on many projects, like we heard before, that help people um, to um, that help to foster direct democracy, that help people to engage in politics and in policy making. Um, there's some online tools in Taiwan, but they also always combine online and offline tools at the same time. And um, she was also active in the Sunflower Movement in 2014, where there was a peaceful occupation of the parliament. Um, and when they asked her to write a job description for her current job, she wrote a poem, or sometimes she also calls it a prayer instead. And I want to end the presentation by reading the poem that she wrote. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experiments, experience, let's make it human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let's always remember that plurality is here. I very much love this poem because it gets to write what it's all about. It's not about technology, because technology will keep changing over time. It's really about the values and the visions. They will carry, carry us a long way. And art, design, and writing can help us to bring those visions to life. This is a call for new narratives to counter dystopian tech visions, a call for utopias and new visions for the future, a call for more diverse and inclusive future. The future is plural. There is no single future. And in order to come up with these diverse and inclusive and colorful futures, we need the voices of the many, many different backgrounds that tell us about their hopes and about their dreams for the future. And I hope that by designing more optimistic outlooks, these two can become self-fulfilling prophecies. Thank you. Ganz herzlichen Dank. This is the uh, website with the magazine and feel free to take a copy of the magazine. There's all the stories in this magazine as well. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.